Hi everybody. This video is meant to be a little supplement to our gene cloning lab because this lab is one of the more conceptually advanced labs. It ties together a lot of ideas that we have learned in recent weeks of our course content. And sometimes it can be hard to really see the big picture of those ideas by just reading the introduction to the protocol. So this video is meant to help with that. So what is the purpose of gene cloning? Gene cloning is a genetic engineering technique that is used to introduce a new gene to an organism that that gene is not normally found in. And gene cloning is an extremely common technique. Um, in fact, when I was a researcher in uh, Arizona State University's Biodesign Institute, gene cloning was basically my entire life uh, while I was working there. Um, it's, it's used all the time. It's really common. If any of you go on to do research, you will encounter it. In this lab, what we are going to be doing is modeling the process of introducing a human gene into a species of bacteria, um, that species of bacteria being E. coli. Um, now, before we get into the nitty gritty details of how this works, let me first pose to you the question, why would anyone want to do this? Why would anyone want to take a piece of DNA, a gene from a human and put it into a totally different organism, a bacterium, E. coli? The answer is the production of therapeutic proteins. Um, so there are a lot of human diseases out there that can be treated by administering medications that consist of a therapeutic protein. So the medication itself is actually a protein. So this is the case when a disease is a genetic disorder that results in a person's body producing a non-functional protein or their body doesn't produce enough of a certain protein. And therapeutic proteins can correct the effects of some of these genetic conditions. Um, for example, one such condition is hemophilia A. Hemophilia is a blood clotting disorder. It's a, it's a genetic disease that results in the failure of the blood to properly clot. And it's dangerous because if a person um, gets a cut or a bruise, they can actually end up um, losing a lot of blood and it's very dangerous um, and can be fatal. Treatment for this disease involves providing people with hemophilia A with a protein that they have low levels of called factor eight, seen right here on the screen. Factor eight is an important protein for blood clotting. People with hemophilia lack sufficient levels of this protein. And so hemophilia can be treated by providing them with levels of this protein that bring it back to normal for them. Another example of a disease that can be treated with therapeutic proteins is certain types of anemia. Um, anemia is a condition that is caused by having uh, abnormally low levels of red blood cells. Um, as you can see in this figure, it shows normal levels of red blood cells. A person who is anemic has too few. And one of the reasons why in certain cases a person has too few red blood cells is they could be lacking in a protein um, that is called erythropoietin. And this protein is important for allowing red blood cells to develop into their fully mature form in the human body. Remember, your body is constantly churning out um, new cells. Red blood cells, uh, their maturation process depends upon having sufficient levels of this protein. So people who lack this protein um, may be anemic and may be able to be treated by supplementation with this protein um, in a medication that consists of it. So those are two examples. The third example that we're actually going to focus on here in this lab is type two diabetes. Um, type two diabetes is by far the most common of these three examples that we have provided. It is a disease that affects blood sugar. Um, what happens in a person who has type two diabetes is the glucose that comes from the food that they eat induces the production of insulin in their bodies. Insulin is a molecule that normally allows 
uh, glucose to be taken out of the bloodstream and pulled into your cells where it can be used as energy. So insulin provides uh, the ability of your cells to suck up glucose from the food that you eat. But people with type 2 diabetes are insulin resistant, meaning that they create the insulin, their bodies generate this insulin, but their cells do not respond to that insulin. Um, they have become resistant to it. And therefore, the glucose remains in the bloodstream. It's not uptaken by the cells, and it can cause uh, dangerously high levels of blood glucose because that glucose is not moving into your cells. It's just staying put in the bloodstream. Um, so people who have type 2 diabetes, you may know, have to take insulin um, in many cases, um, often as an injection. And this is because they have developed a, a tolerance to the normal levels of insulin in their body, and they need to be supplemented with higher levels of insulin that induce the movement of glucose out of the bloodstream into cells. So this is a very common disease in the United States. Over 37 million people in the U.S. are affected by diabetes, which is over 11% of the U.S. population. In other words, more than one in every 10 people are affected by diabetes. Now, the CDC estimates that only about 29 million of those have a diagnosed case. But even among those who have a diagnosed case, even among those 29 million, that is a lot of insulin that needs to be created in order to, to treat um, the, these people who are affected by diabetes. This is a very large population. A lot of medication is required. Um, so insulin, this, this protein insulin um, needs to be generated in large amounts. However, insulin is a very complex molecule. It can't just be created from scratch. And so it has to be created. We have to take insulin from a living organism. It has to be generated by living cells. And the solution that has been developed for generating large amounts of therapeutic insulin protein is genetically engineered bacteria. So how this works is cutting out the gene of interest, which in this case is the gene for making insulin from the human chromosome. We wanna take that gene, cut it out of the human chromosome, and then insert it into a harmless species of bacteria. Now the bacteria have the gene for human insulin, and you can grow those bacteria in very large amounts and then harvest the therapeutic protein, harvest the insulin from those bacteria. This technique carries several advantages. Um, it is easy to do because bacteria grow very quickly and they grow in large numbers, as you can see in this. Uh, this is an actual microscopy image. This is not an animation. This is like this is real life looking at bacteria dividing, although it has been sped up. And it's also cheaper and more ethical than using animals as the source of insulin. Insulin used to be sourced from pigs. Um, but obviously, as you can imagine, that is a bit more messy, messy um, both physically and from a bioethics standpoint uh, than using genetically engineered bacteria to uh, produce this, this insulin that is needed to treat this population. So this is the, the basic justification for using genetically engineered bacteria to generate therapeutic proteins. And this is the process that we're going to be modeling in today's lab. We're going to cut out a gene, we're going to insert it into bacteria, uh, and that is the, the basic idea of, of gene cloning in our lab that we're addressing here. So let's talk about how we cut out genes. Genes are cut out of DNA using restriction enzymes, which is a class of enzymes that is able to cut through a piece of DNA at a specific sequence of nucleotides. Remember, DNA is consistent of nucleotides that each have different nitrogenous bases, A, T, G, and C. Restriction enzymes are enzymes that are able to read those sequences of letters, recognize certain sequences, and then they slice through DNA when they see a particular sequence of letters.
Restriction enzymes actually originate from bacteria themselves. Um, you may remember if you've if you've watched the uh, viruses lecture, or if if you haven't yet, then you soon will see uh, that bacteria are susceptible to being infected by viruses. And when they are infected by viruses, viruses will inject their DNA into the bacterial cell and in many cases initiate a hostile takeover uh, through the use of their DNA. So restriction enzymes are actually part of the bacteria's defense mechanism against these viral infections. Restriction enzymes, as they are found in nature, are used by bacteria to chop up pieces of viral DNA that are the result of a foreign invasion and infection by a virus. Now, we as humans, we as scientists, have learned this, and we have actually been able to take restriction enzymes from bacteria, purify them, and use them in genetic engineering and gene cloning for our own purposes. And there are hundreds of different restriction enzymes that have been characterized at this point. This chart right here shows you an example of some of these restriction enzymes. Um, over here, we have the name of the restriction enzyme. Um, for example, this first enzyme at the top of the list is called ECORI. And you'll see that the name of each of these enzymes is actually derived from the species of bacteria in which it was discovered. So ECORI. I or eco R1 is originally from Escherichia coli uh, or E. coli. That's the species of bacteria that it comes from. And eco R1 will cut DNA whenever it sees the sequence G A A T T C. And as we go down this list, we can see that, that there are several uh, other restriction enzymes listed here. They each have a different sequence that they recognize and that they cut at. Um, and when I was working in a lab, we had a chart not unlike this one, only bigger, that had the name of the enzyme and it had the recognition sequence and it was pasted on the wall for everyone to see so that when we were doing our gene cloning, we could, we could draw from that information. In this last column right here, there's an additional piece of information, blunt or sticky end. Um, so what this, what this is referring to is when the enzyme makes a cut through the DNA, does it cut bluntly? In other words, does it slice directly through both of the strands of this double-stranded piece of DNA at the same location? Or does it make a nick uh, and then make a jagged cut? A jagged cut is referred to as a sticky end. And so that's what this, this is referring to right here. And on the next slide, I'm going to show you what that actually looks like. So in this example, we have a uh, enzyme ECOR1 that cuts through DNA at GAATTC. Here we have a larger piece of DNA, but in blue, we have highlighted the sequence that is recognized by the ECOR1 enzyme. So ECOR1 will, will search through a sequence of DNA when it comes across GAATTC, it will attach to the DNA at that point, and it will cut through the DNA, not in a blunt fashion, but in what they call a sticky end fashion. It will create a jagged cut where it slices through one strand first, then it severs the hydrogen bonds in the middle section, and then it slices through the other strand. And these are called sticky ends that it leaves here. The little tails here that it creates at either end are called sticky ends. And now importantly, these sticky ends, these are open to be attached to other sequences. Uh, if, if this restriction enzyme has cut another piece of DNA and left another piece of DNA with a compatible sticky end, it can attach to um, and reseal itself back up to another piece of DNA that has that sticky end um, as long as it reads with the compatible sequence. And that's important to the principles of this lab as well, because our goal is to take 
a human gene, cut it out using these enzymes, and then reinsert it, stick it into a piece of DNA that will go into the bacteria. That piece of DNA that goes into the bacteria is called a bacterial plasmid. So we've learned previously that bacteria, like human cells, they're prokaryotic in nature, but they do have chromosomes. Um, however, in addition to those chromosomes, they also have much smaller pieces of DNA called plasmids. So these plasmids are kind of like bonus DNA. They're little circles, little loops of DNA that exist separate from the bacterial chromosomes. And rather than trying to splice human genes into the bacterial chromosome, it's easier to insert genes into plasmids because they are small and they're easy to transfer into bacterial cells from the outside. So the goal here is to take the human gene for insulin, cut it out of the human chromosome, and insert it into a plasmid, which then can be stuck inside of the bacteria and create this new strain of genetically engineered bacteria that can then be used as essentially an insulin-making factory to generate this medicine. So now that we've sort of looked at the foundational principles here, um, let's take a look at the step-by-step -step process that you're going to be following as you go through the lab protocol. Um, now, the first step of this process is going to be to look at the sequence of letters in the DNA surrounding the human gene, meaning the insulin gene, as well as looking at the sequence of letters in the bacterial plasmid. Because the goal is to find a restriction enzyme that will cut the DNA the right number of times and in the right number of places. So essentially what we have is, is a sequence of human DNA. We've got a gene that we're interested in cutting out, and we want to find a restriction enzyme that just happens to have a sequence that will cut the human DNA twice, once on each side of this gene. We also want that same restriction enzyme to cut our bacterial plasmid only once in one location. And the reason why is because we ultimately want to take that plasmid, open it up, and then take that human insulin gene that has been chopped out of the human chromosome and then combine them together, insert the human insulin gene into the plasmid so that this can be delivered to the bacterial cells. Once you have completed this insertion process, now it's called a recombinant plasmid because it is a plasmid that has been quote unquote recombined with other DNA, the human insulin DNA. It is a recombinant plasmid. And while this may seem like a difficult task, um, how could you possibly find a restriction enzyme that, that cuts in these locations just where you want it? There are so many restriction enzymes out there that you can almost always find a restriction enzyme that will serendipitously cut in the locations that you want it to because there are so many different sequences. Like, like, like I said, there's hundreds of these things. There are so many different sequences that you have to choose from and so many different enzymes that you have um, on hand when you're working in a laboratory. In our case, to simplify this exercise, we have narrowed the possibilities to only eight different restriction enzymes. So when you're performing this first step, you only have to be mindful of these eight restriction enzymes. One of these eight is going to work for you. One of these eight is going to cut around your human insulin gene and it's going to cut your plasmid once. Um, so that is the first step. Once you have identified this restriction enzyme, the one out of the eight that works for your situation, uh, which again means that it cuts the DNA on either side of the insulin gene and it cuts through the plasmid once, you're gonna cut the DNA accordingly. 
Now in a laboratory setting, this would be done in test tubes and in incubators. But in our case, since we're just modeling this process, you're going to use scissors to cut the paper that represents our DNA sequences. And then once you have cut these guys, um, you want to take the human insulin gene and insert it into the plasmid. So you've got your, your paper strip that represents the human insulin gene. You've got your paper strip that represents the plasmid. Insert them together and seal them together. In the lab, this is done using an enzyme called ligase. And you may remember that we have previously learned in chapter 14 that ligase is an enzyme that's involved in DNA replication. It is the enzyme that comes along at the end of the process and it seals up those gaps in the backbone left between the Okazaki fragments. In the lab, a purified version of this enzyme is used to seal up uh, the, the two pieces of DNA that you want to link together with their compatible sticky ends. Of course, at home, we're just modeling this process, so you're just going to be using tape to seal up the chopped up pieces of plasmid and human DNA that you have created. Now, our model is going to stop here, but for this lab, it's also important that you understand what happens after this point. Once you have created this recombinant plasmid, the recombinant plasmid has to be added to bacterial cells, because again, that's the whole purpose. We want to take these, these bacterial cells and genetically engineer them and turn them into insulin-making factories so we can harvest the insulin, use it for therapeutic purposes. This step of adding the plasmid that you've created to bacterial cells is called bacterial transformation because it genetically transforms the bacteria by adding in new genetic information. Bacterial transformation has a relatively low success rate. It only works for about every one in 100 cells that you have in a sample. Um, so if you have, you know, 100 cells, only one will accept the plasmid that you are offering. The other 99 say, no thanks, I'm not taking that plasmid. And so because of this really high failure rate of bacterial transformation, it is important that you have a way to distinguish between bacteria that have accepted the plasmid, those one in 100, and the 99 in 100 that failed in this experiment. And the way that you distinguish between the ones that worked and the ones that didn't is by taking those bacteria and growing them in a petri dish that has a nutrient medium containing an antibiotic. Antibiotics normally kill bacteria. However, the plasmid contains not just the gene for human insulin, the plasmid also contains a gene for antibiotic resistance. In other, other words, it means that uh, by taking in this plasmid, bacteria will be able to survive in the presence of antibiotics that would normally kill them. So in turn, this means that only the 1% of bacterial cells that have accepted the plasmid will survive. The other 99% will be killed when grown in this fashion. And this allows you to distinguish between bacterial cells that have accepted the plasmid and have been successfully genetically engineered and the bacterial cells that have failed this genetic engineering process. When you do this process uh, without antibiotics, this is what you might get at the end. You might get a Petri dish that is coated with bacteria um, and there's just no way to distinguish between which ones have uh, successfully been transformed and the ones that have not. When you grow the bacterial sample on a plate with antibiotics, very few may grow. Only a handful of little bacterial colonies may develop, but you know that these are the ones that took in the plasmid. Not only do they have the gene that allows them to survive the presence of the antibiotics, but they also have the gene for human insulin, which resides in that same plasmid. And so these are the little bacterial insulin making factories that can then be scaled up and used for the production of this therapeutic protein.